The Dutch are known the world over for their beautiful, colorful fields of tulips. Now, if you see a picture of the Netherlands, chances are that somewhere in that picture you'll find a tulip, probably a whole lot of tulips. My grandma, she would love to remind us of how it was one of our ancestors who brought the very first tulips to her little Dutch town in Iowa. A little bit of trivia about tulips, though. Uh, you, you know this already if you've sat in virtually any economics class. The tulip was responsible for what may have been the very first speculative bubble in modern economics. Now, when tulip mania, that's what it's called, tulip mania, reached its peak in 1637, you could buy a single bulb of a sought-after variety for ten times the annual income of a skilled artisan. That really caught people by surprise. I mean, nothing like this had ever happened before. This idea that something could increase so dramatically in value and then so quickly it could just vanish. And that left a lot of people with this fear of missing out at first, driving prices higher and higher, and then the bubble pops. Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were supply issues with things like toilet paper, lumber, even food. Um, shelves were left empty, and in the case of lumber, prices are still rising. Many economists were predicting that the Canadian housing bubble would finally burst uh, due to the way the pandemic was putting pressures on our society. But the exact opposite happened. And what I find really interesting, though, is how little we understand about how these systems, even these systems that we, humanity, has created, like economics, how these systems work. I mean, even the experts often misunderstand the forces that are at work within the marketplace. <laughs> and we can bring that same cavalier attitude to our understanding of Scripture. And something I love about God's Word is that He goes to great lengths to make it accessible, even simple, without being simplistic. Two weeks ago, we were talking about the power that we actually can find in submitting to Christ. Last week, we were talking about the transformation that we find in allowing God to live and work through us. Well, today we get to focus on that word submission again and understanding it in the context of our transformed life as we follow Christ. We're going, to particularly, we're going to be particularly looking at how we submit to those in authority over us. Go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 2.13. That word submission, though, I mean, it's not popular. It, it cuts against the grain of our rugged sense of individualism here in Alberta. But that word, I, I do not think it means what you think it means. As you hear these words from the scripture, I want you to listen and, and try to understand from God's perspective. God, who became human so that he could suffer for us, submitting even to death. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it is to be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So there are three things in this passage that I really want to point out. The first is that we have freedom. We're not bound to follow the rules and regulations of this world. But, and it's a big but, we are supposed to be living as servants of God. If you look back at verse 13, and this is the second point, we're being subject to the government regardless of its, its goodness or its righteousness. We're subject to, Peter says here, every human institution because we are submitting to Christ. And, and that's the, the final point really, is that as we're submitting to these human institutions, even the government, uh, we, we're gonna see this through Peter and we've seen it in Daniel, that God is always in control. He's in control over these institutions, regardless of whether or not they are motivated by good things, whether they are trying to do right. God is in control. And so in verse 14, Peter doesn't just say, 
that the governors, the government will be good or that it will even have right intentions, but rather he says that God will work through these institutions ultimately in the grand picture to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good. And by this time, Peter, he spent a lot of time in government prisons. He's had friends, good friends, who have been murdered or even executed as they were subject to these human institutions because of their faith. I mean, think back to last week. Daniel is able to celebrate the very man who made him a captive because he sees God at work in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Now, in a similar fashion, Peter, he's able to see God at work in the government, an empire that was set on persecuting people for their faith. Why? It goes back to that second point. And Peter's first priority is always his submission to Christ. And he understands that submission so well. Paul also reflects on this motivation as he encourages Timothy to pray for all people in 1 Timothy 2, 2 through 3. Pray for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. You see, our obedience to authority, it reflects back on God and it brings him glory. Imagine what would have happened if the early New Testament church had simply refused to obey the government. The early church understood that there was nothing that could take away the freedom that they had in Christ. They weren't confident in their own abilities or in their own voice with their government. They really had none. But they were confident in the power of Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it's that confidence that they have in Christ that allowed them to live under even ungodly leadership. Because that's not where their hope was. Their hope was in Jesus. And so our actions are going to be scrutinized by the world. And they were in the early church, too, heavily. Leaders wanted to see if they were going to revolt against the government, if they were going to spark uprisings. And there were a lot of foolish people who, in their ignorance of the basic teachings of Jesus, they leveled unfair accusations against believers. It happened then, it's certainly going to happen now. But Peter continued to encourage the believers to ignore these ignorant criticisms and be model citizens submitting to Christ in all things. So let's consider this in a slightly different context. Peter talks about slaves and servants. Now this isn't a direct parallel to your job. I know that sometimes though it might feel like you are a slave and in some circles it's even popular today to use the phrase wage slave. Personally though I think that's doing a disservice to those who, who have lived under or, or who even now are living in slavery. Slavery and, and human trafficking are still very real problems in a literal sense that need to be dealt with in our world today. But I think we can learn quite a bit from the relationship that Peter is describing here. I mean, an employment contract, whether it's written down or it's just a verbal agreement, it, it does have very significant limitations that we are giving up our freedom for, our time to be subject to our employer. So let's continue reading them. In 1 Peter 2, uh, I'll read 18 through 21. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now, the question that I have here is, why does Peter only address slaves? In some translations, it talks about household servants, which is very similar. It's clear that not everyone who followed Christ at this point was a slave. There were also merchants and craftsmen, soldiers, even uh, religious leaders, priests, who had received the gospel, even in these churches that Peter is writing to. 
And I think a big part of why Peter focuses on this relationship is that it, on a very basic level, it's, it's simple and universally understood. The master tells the slave what to do. The slave does it often without any question. Now, Peter here gives a picture of a slave serving under a master who is neither good nor gentle, but rather unjust. And that's a big ask. I mean, have you ever been subject to someone who was unjust? Or maybe even merely unfair. Perhaps you've had an employer who, who showed favoritism for someone else in the office. Or who had expectations that were completely untethered from reality. At the IT department that I managed, we had an unwritten rule that if you were going to be late, you had to bring donuts for the entire department. Now, in my mind, this recognized that that person had been an inconvenience to everyone else who was on time. And it gave the latecomer a chance to reconcile with their colleagues. I was surprised though one day when one of my employees pointed out that buying donuts meant that that person was going to be even more late. And we didn't even like donuts that much in the first place. Maybe there's a policy where you're working right now that makes even less sense than that policy. Maybe it seems to you that there's no way to address that problem that certainly was the position of a slave. There was no recourse. There was no way for them to move forward with the problems or grievances that they had. So Peter here is reminding those slaves in the early church that while we, we don't seek suffering as followers of Jesus, we are often called to suffer. Because we are following Jesus who suffered for us. Is God calling you to suffer? to present a clear and living testimony to the hope that can be found only in Jesus, the transformation that we can only experience in Christ. Now our mission here at Grace Point is to point the way to truth and life. Is God giving you an opportunity through the way that you follow your employer's instructions to point others to Jesus? Yeah. I'm just asking this as a question because none of you are slaves except we are slaves to Christ. But in your particular situation, there are other options open to you. God doesn't always call us to suffer, but sometimes he does provide a way out. So consider your situation in light of God's word. Spend time in prayer with God to understand how your master is leading. Jesus, how Jesus is leading. Seek wise counsel among those who are also following Jesus. In all things, focus on Christ. In all things, Christ. He is our master who has suffered and died for us. He lives even now serving us, living through us. So we need to be praying more for the authorities in charge, either governments or your teachers or your boss, your, your wife or your husband for your parents and so forth. I mean, who can you add to that list? I think it's, it's easy to find fault right now, especially with our government. It's probably easy to find fault with your employer, maybe your wife or your husband, your children, your parents. We're good at seeing problems in other people. And oftentimes the way that we criticize those in authority, we do it in such a way there's no positive impact. We complain to our friends. We gossip at the water cooler, before COVID we did anyways. We vent online and, and yet as Christians, we say that Jesus is the answer. Well, if Jesus is the answer, then we need to get down on our knees. We need to ask God to show his mercy and grace to those in authority over us. We need to follow Jesus' example and, and look for opportunities to serve, to be a part of the solution. And yes, sometimes even to suffer, to lay aside our freedoms because of our submission to Jesus, because we have confidence in the freedom that Christ has secured for us, and because we are submitting to Christ. Now this also means that we're not blindly subject to authority. As a church, we've been committed throughout the pandemic to keeping our doors open, to finding ways to connect with people who are alone, to care for those who are broken, not only by the pandemic, but also by the restrictions. Now, even as we submit to Christ by being subject to the authorities over us, we still have a responsibility to our neighbors. So we don't just pray for those in authority, but we also pray for everyone. If you're suffering right now because of the restrictions or because of the pandemic, you're not suffering alone. Others have likely faced greater loss. Others 
I mean, if you're suffering because you work under someone who is unjust, chances are you're not suffering alone there either. And even if you are, there are other unjust employers in the world, and there are other people who are suffering in a similar way. It's not enough that we merely suffer. Submission is not capitulation. And so we don't merely suffer, we follow the entirety of Christ's example, and we look for ways to serve, for ways to be a part of the solution. I'd like to close with a blessing today from John 8.32. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Would you pray with me? Lord, we want to thank you that we are truly free in you. And yet, Lord, you are our priority. And so we ask that you would show us how we can set an example, how we can show the truth and the hope that you have given us in a way that our our neighbors, our our boss, our our government even, Lord, will look on and, and learn to respect you because of the godly example that we have set. Lord, we recognize that there are times when we will not always be able to to follow the instructions that we are given. And in those times, Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom that we might follow your direction in a loving way, that we might represent your hope in a way that makes it clear that we do not seek to offend, but merely to do right. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment that as we interact with people who don't understand your truth, that we could make it clear to them, not only by the words that we choose, but also by the actions that we take. Lord, open our eyes to those who are hurting in our community. Open our eyes to those who have faced difficulty through the pandemic, through the restrictions. Help us to see how we can serve them, even as you have served us, Lord, that we could share your hope with them, not only through our words, but through the tangible example that everyone in Medicine Hat, Lord, would have an opportunity to know you, to follow you, to love you. We pray this in your awesome name. Amen.